Oh, please pray with me. Lord, we do thank you for another day of life, and we do pray that you would train our hands for righteousness, and we pray that you would train us for the righteousness of the warfare that we are involved in in the new covenant. And we thank you, Jesus, for teaching us to pray uh, to our Heavenly Father that you, Father, would lead us not into temptation and that you would deliver us from the evil one. We ask that you would bless our study as we continue tonight and Isaiah and looking at um, the coming of Jesus, the preparation for that coming, um, and also the, de the delightfulness. If the Old Covenant Holy Day was to be delightful, uh, we pray for um, all the more uh, the delightfulness of it in the New Covenant now that you, Jesus, uh, and your work is finished. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, so we are in Isaiah 58 and 59. This last Lord's Day, um, I read from both chapters. Both go together. They are development of Isaiah 53 and the work of the servant of the Lord. I think sometimes that's hard. And when you read maybe chapter by chapter, or preach chapter by chapter, uh, you might lose the, the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is the, the coming of Christ. So we noted in Isaiah 58 that Isaiah is told to declare the transgressions and sins to God's people. Um, the previous Bible study in Isaiah chapter 57, God says, I will declare your righteousness. Um, but of course, Israel had no righteousness. Now is there, there's a declaration of transgression and sin. These are key words regarding the Day of Atonement and the placing of transgression, sin, and iniquity on the scapegoat. In verses 2 and 3 of Isaiah 58, Israel can't figure out why God hasn't been blessing them. Um, it's their the hypocrisy we learn in verses 3 through 5. Uh, when they, Israel was fasting, their sinful desires uh, were for oppression and contention, strife and wickedness. Um, this is nothing new. It goes all the way back to Isaiah 1. Uh, we, uh, in verses 6 and 7, God explains what true fasting looks like. He describes righteousness, the kind of righteousness Jesus speaks about in Matthew 25. And in verses 8 through 12, God reveals to Isaiah what his blessing looks like for those who choose his fast Verses 13 and 14, which I hope to look at more tonight. God addresses the Sabbath, although it's related to the, the fasting um, and the blessings of delighting in God in his holy day. And in chapter 59, uh, God declares Israel's transgressions, sin, and iniquity. And God's servant, Jesus, is the one who will accomplish righteousness and salvation at the end of Isaiah 59. So again, it's not our self-righteousness. So to... Um, so we'll be looking at our, we'll be zeroing in on Isaiah 58, um, verses 13 and 14. So it'll be our text. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my, my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So as we uh, uh, look at the, the Lord's Day and the, the Christian Sabbath and the Old Covenant Sabbath here in Isaiah 58, uh, I want to emphasize again that the, the root of all of this is the heart. So Israel again was bowing with their, their heads but not with their hearts. So um, And the heart is seen here with the, the emphasis on delight. Um, Isaiah 58, as we'll be looking at it tonight, this is a key verse in Reformation history and how the Lord's Day is to be observed in the New Covenant. And I believe it was the Puritan Thomas Watson who first called the, the Lord's Day the market day of the soul, which I think fits very well with um, the, the sentiment here in Isaiah chapter 58. So this is a day we believe is set apart for public worship, for piety. By piety, I mean things like prayer, Bible reading, hospitality, fellowship, you know, the feasting. Uh, works of mercy. Uh, one of the key ideas, even though we'll be looking at some historical background, one of the key ideas for us tonight is that the Christian Sabbath should be a delight to us, and we should strive to share this delight in the Lord with others. <clears throat> and so for my understanding about the Lord's Day is we kept, it's kind of every Lord's Day, we have AM prayer uh, or congregational singing, or like this Lord's Day, we have a read through the Bible class, uh, we have our AM worship. Um, we have hospitality usually after. Uh, we have a monthly fellowship meal. 
um, but also informal meals where we have it either here at the church or others invite others into their home. So hospitality is part of this. Uh, we have our afternoon worship service. Uh, quarterly, we've uh, begun doing a uh, third worship service at the, the Pines. And um, after that, usually it's rest. So the, the Lord's Day is actually a day of, it's a different kind of work. That's how um, the, the Westminster Assembly describes it, works of mercy, necessity, and piety. So it's a day that I'm definitely most exhausted on. Um, again, it's a day of work, but it's a, it's a different kind of work. And, and in fact, um, you should remember, for all of the work that we do, and um, I often encourage people sometimes to take a break. I swap pulpits a lot or take breaks, so I probably observe the, the Sabbath day 40 times out of the year in this way uh, with, you know, with everything that goes on. So it's an extremely busy day. Um, so when I go away, for example, I might not have an afternoon worship service depending on uh, where the church is at, or there, there might be um, less to do. So it's a very, um, it's a demanding day, and um, so I, I might be too much. So I'm, I'm not, but I do, we do offer um, everything that you could want to do on the Lord's Day. Uh, we, we try to uh, make time for that. Um, I also want to emphasize tonight that the, the Puritans, which kind of goes back to our Reformed heritage, more than anyone else have shaped my view on this. So it's, uh, and uh, especially Isaiah 58 and the emphasis on um, delight. So that's what we'll be uh, exploring um, this evening. Um, so uh, again, a couple of uh, more things for background. Uh, I won't talk a whole lot about this, but when you think about the Sabbath day or the fourth commandment, this is one of the overarching themes of the Bible. Um, it, it encompasses so much that it's a testing ground for one's theology and interpretation. Um, <clears throat> there, again, I've just given a list, and this is not exhaustive, um, but the, uh, the Sabbath, Lord's Day, um, it encompasses the early chapters of Genesis, uh, the, our week, one day and seven. Uh, Noah's Ark and the Flood is actually built around the Sabbath day. Um, so very interestingly, it's there in Noah's day. Um, in the time of Abraham, you have the, the Sabbath with circumcision. So remember, it's on the eighth day uh, that you have circumcision, um, which is pointing also to the work of Christ, a new heart, a new creation. Um, of course, in the time of Moses, you have redemption from slavery in Egypt. You have the change of Israel's calendar in Exodus chapter 12. And uh, in Leviticus 23, you have the Mosaic Levitical laws. So you have this, the one day and seven Sabbath in Leviticus 23. Uh, but then you have um, maybe nine, nine other Sabbaths with all the feast days and the weeks. Those were all called Sabbaths, even if it didn't. And not all of them happened on the seventh day of the week, by the way. So a lot of times the Sabbath, um, Sabbath means rest. It does not mean seventh. I've heard people say that. But, uh, but you could rest on a Wednesday. So it, it was... Sabbath was rest, and it didn't always occur on the, the last day of the week, on Saturday. Um, the building of the tabernacle in Moses' day was modeled after the Sabbath day. Um, but there was a mandatory retirement for priests at the age of 50. I'm pretty sure that's Sabbatarian, uh, going back to the seven times seven. Um, in Exodus, the Sabbath is called a perpetual covenant. Uh, it is a sign for Israel. Um, in Isaiah, um, it's an everlasting covenant. It's a, a new covenant. I think that's how I understand it. So what Isaiah is writing about the Sabbath isn't just the old covenant Sabbath. It's a new covenant Sabbath. Um, of course, Jesus expounds the Sabbath. He is the one through whom all things were made. So you think of the creation of the Sabbath. Um, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. So he not only rested in Genesis 2, um, but he <laughs> brings about the rest of redemption And when he says it is finished. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, has a lot to say about the, the Sabbath, um, uh, not just the, the ceremonial Sabbaths, which the uh, Judaizers were trying to introduce in places like Romans and Galatians, um, but um, he applies the Sabbath to Christ's finished work. We're justified by grace through faith, not by works, and that's a very Sabbatarian uh, statement. And the book of Hebrews talks about, uh, in Hebrews 4.9, 
uh, there remains for us a Sabbath keeping. And, um, and we could, the, the book of Revelation also develops this. But our focus tonight, um, having said that, will be on Isaiah chapter 58, um, because this is where we are at. Um, why the focus? Well, we are pe- preaching through Isaiah and teaching through it. I did receive two sermon requests last year. Um, one was for question 117 of the larger catechism, how is the Lord's day to be sanctified? And you can see that uh, one of the verses there, this is very key, uh, key for uh, understanding Puritan, understanding of the fourth commandment, Isaiah 58. So Isaiah 58 has a central place. Um, I won't be able to develop all of um, the larger catechism, but we will. you'll hear a lot of themes in what we're talking about. So how is the Sabbath or the Lord's Day to be sanctified. The Sabbath, or Lord's Day, is to be sanctified by an holy resting all the day, not only from such works as are at all times sinful, but even from such worldly employments and recreations as are on other days lawful, and making it our delight to spend, so again, there's an emphasis on delight, to spend the whole time, except so much as uh, to be taken up in the works of necessity and mercy in the public and private exercises of God's worship. And to that end, we are to prepare our hearts and with such foresight, diligence, and moderation to dispose and seasonably dispatch our worldly business that we may be more free, the more free and fit for the duties of that day. Um, There's also a sermon request on the directory of public worship. So uh, I also talked about this a little bit, but I didn't mention the directory on the Lord's Day. Um, So our directory in the Constitution talks about under the New Testament, there is no day commanded in Scripture to be kept holy but the Lord's Day, which is the Christian Sabbath. Nevertheless, it may be appropriate to separate a day or days for public fasting or thanksgiving as extraordinary dispensations of God's providence give uh, occasion. So it's been a few years since we've had a, a fast day. Uh, every year do we do have an evening of Thanksgiving. Um, we don't celebrate Holy Week, so a lot of Christians this week celebrate Holy Week, Monday, Thursday. I guess when, today's Thursday, right? So it's the foot washing uh, day. I, I ex- talked about how I grew up uh, doing that. And um, so we don't uh, celebrate uh, Holy Week. This is what our directory um, is, uh, is um, discussing here. Uh, the Directory of Public Worship, though, does not mean that RP preachers cannot preach a sermon on the theme of Jesus' resurrection at this time of the year, or nor does it mean that a preacher cannot preach a sermon on the theme of the Incarnation in December. So these things are left for the wisdom and discretion of sessions and the, the pastor. So I don't think this Lord's Day will be preaching a themed Lord's uh, sermon in the morning on the resurrection just because of we're reading through the Bible uh, but I will in their afternoon uh, worship service at the Oneida Center. All right, so that's the, the introduction of uh, Isaiah 58. A little bit of background about our own standards, our Constitution. Um, and I'd like to dig a little bit deeper how uh, we got here. Um, um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss this. So in, as we go back to the Westminster Confession, the, the, conf- the Westminster Confession and the Catechisms, it, it was a development of theology for about 130 years. So uh, Martin Luther nails the 95 Theses uh, to the Wittenberg, Wittenberg door in 1517. And then in 1643, uh, you have the Westminster Assembly. Um, and so in England, in Puritan New England, it's about 130 years that the church have been thinking about this. Um, now this is important because it's been about 130 years in the United States, uh, especially with the influence of dispensationalism, um, that the, the Sabbath has been really undermined in our society. So the Sabbath, the Lord's Day, has been undermined by the church, in particular with dispensationalism, and uh, culturally, there is no Sabbath anymore. So uh, there is a little bit left, but it's very, very hard um, where, because sports and everything is encroaching on the Lord's Day. So the, when the Westminster Standards were written, uh, um, it was very different. You have like the, the high point of 130 years of thinking and reflecting and struggling with this. 
we're kind of on the lowdown, right? So we're about 130 years uh, in which it is being, uh, it's been kind of dismantled, uh, and the Lord's Day is, um, it's, it, it's almost like um, um, unique to us as a, a Reformed church. So it, we live in a, a very uh, different time. So um, any comments or questions um, before we uh, look a little bit more at the, the history of these things? <coughs> Heidi. Could you just explain again why Noah had to do with the Sabbath? <laughs> I missed that somehow. So that's a good question. So uh, how did Noah have to do with the Sabbath? I don't have time to go back, but if you look at the references to the days in Noah, it's a Sabbatarian. Uh, it, it, it works around as a, a calendar of seven days. And Noah's name means rest. So there, there's a Sabbatarian theme in Noah. So it's not, it's not like one day in, well, it is actually one day in seven um, that you find. So th yes, it, it's there in Noah. Mm. So, but I did not bring the calendar with me, but it, you can actually put it on a, a calendar and map that out. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, you could literally spend years and, well, I have spent years and years thinking about all these things, but yeah, good question. Any other comments or questions, John? I have a question. <coughs> Um, by some churches that um, celebrate Easter and Christmas or any other uh, holiday in the Roman Catholic liturgical calendar, wouldn't that be considered a fourth commandment violation because it's like they're elevating it above the Lord's uh, 52 holy days? Well, yeah, so part of our heritage as Reformed Presbyterians, and uh, again, th this is kind of like one of the, the high points of the Reformation um, you come to in the 17th century. Um, y you have an understanding of the regulative principle of worship. Now, it was not called that until a good deal later, I think, in history, but it's the idea that you can't add or subtract in worship what God has commanded. Now, that applies to the calendar also. So you can't add calendar days or you can't take away calendar days. So you can't say we're going to skip this Lord's Day and we're going to stay home and not worship. We don't have that. So, yes, um, the adding and subtracting of days and calendar days is it's actually related to our understanding of um, worshiping God as he has commanded. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other comments or questions? And I do believe this is a better way. So I, I, I'm this is a delight. So we don't want to lose... Uh, track uh, of that. If you want to see my Sabbath in practice, you just you can follow me around on the Lord's Day, and and that's uh, that, and that's that's that I've been very influenced by the Puritans. <laughs> that's that's why I do what we, that's why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. Heidi, I think that it's the works of necessity that sometimes are the hardest mm -hmm. to not make legalistic. What is necessity? Yeah, and especially in our modern society. Um, much is done for us that wasn't in the past. Like, remember there was a guy who got killed for picking up sticks? In the Bible? On the yes. Sabbath? Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. That's part of the Mosaic so Sabbath. It, mm -hmm. it really does have to do with the heart. Yes. And I, yeah. But the, the hard part is that well-meaning people would say, this is how I keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Because this is what I feel is restful for me, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, or so it it really it seems like it could be divisive very quickly in the church. For sure. How people yeah. keep the Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah. And in part, the English Civil War, as we'll see, was fought over this. It, it, it was related. But yeah, it's it, it's it's uh, it shouldn't be divisive. We're talking about delighting in the Lord. So if you want to argue with me about delighting in the Lord. I guess we can argue about that, but it's a it's a joyful thing, and I. But for some reason, people lose sight of it. It's kind of like people lose sight of the meaning of the Lord's Supper very easily. It's supposed to unify the church, but for some reason, it divides the church, and that's always been the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John. What would you say to Christians who say uh, Jesus is my Sabbath, so I can continue working on Sunday? Jesus is my Sabbath, so I can uh, keep working on Sunday. Um, so uh, the understanding of the, the Sabbath goes back to it's a day for um, worship. 
and, and, and rest. So yes, absolutely, Jesus is our rest, and we are justified by uh, God's grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. So I can't emphasize that um, enough. But that, that Christian would be, I, I think, just they need discipleship. Yeah. And I, again, I want to emphasize in this, and I want to be careful, we have been 130 years, I'm just using that because from, refer- from Martin Luther to the Westminster, I'm saying it's about 130 years, or we just round up to 150, it doesn't matter. But for the last 150 years in our nation, everyone is, the, the church in particular has been dismantling it. So um, unfortunately, yeah, Christians are not trained. And Jesus says something about that in Matthew chapter 5, uh, about the importance of understanding that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Um, but you, you don't want to undermine the law of God and be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So that's, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're going against the tide of 150 years of people, Christians, um, arguing against it. And I'm going to say dispensationalism has been a huge bad influence um, on that. Yeah. Other comments or questions? So, all right. So again, you want to be gentle. You want to be. You, you want to be. Um, you know, patient with other people and and understand um, that that we're on the. Uh, we, we live in a culture that has kind of uh, gone against this, and in particular, I think the church. Okay. So why the focus again? The um, this is a distinctive. And in uh, James Dennison's *The Market Day of the Soul*, if you like history, this is a, a great book on the Puritan doctrine of the Sabbath. Um, the Westminster Standards, he says, contain the most complete statement of the doctrine of the Sabbath to be found anywhere in the Reformed Confessions. So, the, and, and part of that reason is because of um, the Reformation and, and how it came about in England. All right, so again, I want to emphasize the heart. I want to emphasize uh, the, the importance of delight because if for some reason it always seems to be something that people get upset about and they want to fight about. I hope I'm not uh, the reason for that. Um, I, I don't keep the Sabbath day as I ought. I'm, I, none of the, the commandments of God, so I'm not, I haven't arrived. <laughs> like, um, this is something I struggle with. I struggle with my own heart and my own delight. I struggle singing psalms of I was glad to hear them say to the Lord, Lord's house, let us go, right? <laughs> I struggle with that. So it's a, it's, it's a struggle. Um, and again, we're all growing in sanctification uh, in, in this. And, and I just make it your prayer. Lord, help me to delight in this day. Maybe I don't, under, I don't agree with Pastor Aaron. That's all right. But I want to agree with you, God. That's the most important thing. That's, that's what I'm just asking you to consider. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully we can agree uh, about uh, some things, in particular the delightfulness of this. So um, <clears throat> let's. Um, so as we um, move along, going back to the Protestant Reformation, and um, again, I'm trying to I w- I'm trying to tie this into our own generation. So I know you might think, well, this is 400 years ago, um, but it it actually has a lot of modern application for us. So at the the time of the Protestant Reformation. Um, you have a, a growth and understanding of what it means to worship in spirit and truth. Um, but not so really with the Roman Catholic priesthood, right? So there's a huge break with the idea of Roman Catholicism, its ceremonialism, its altars and priests and everything. But the Reformation came to, a, I think, a, an understanding biblically of uh, a biblical worship. Um, of course, you have the Reformation emphasis on worship in the language that people understand, Right. Um, and the, but in, in Roman Catholicism is the Latin Mass, so you, you had no clue what the priest was saying unless you, you knew Latin or had been attending many years and picked up Latin phrases. Um, in the Protestant Reformation, there's a rise in the understanding of the Lord's Day um, and, and kind of, uh, more of a rejection of the liturgical calendar. So in different Protestant churches, this worked its way out um, differently. Now, what I want you to see here on this slide is in 1517, Luther nails the 95 Theses to the Wittenberg door. Now, the Reformation came to England in 1534, but it came to England, and this is part of our background um, as a Reformed Presbyterian church, that um, in 1534, Henry VIII, who was the king of England at the time, broke away from the Roman Catholic Church and declared himself (coughs) the supreme head of the Church of England. All right, so this is, this is key. 
So what happened in England is that the Roman Catholic Church would not annul King Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. So Rome had this, has a strange view of marriage and divorce. There is no divorce. We'll annul the marriage and say you were never married. But the Pope would not give that annulment to King Henry VIII. So what King Henry VIII did, and the time was kind of ripe, right, because there are a lot of other countries breaking off and cities from Roman Catholicism, is that Henry said, okay, we're going to become, you know, Protestants. We're not going to submit to the Pope anymore. <clears throat> now, in other countries and cities, the break was more complete. Think of Lutheranism in Germany. You know, there, there's a complete break. Or Geneva, Switzerland, you know, and the, the Reformed movement. But in England, you, now you have the king who is the supreme head of the church, right? We don't have a pope anymore, but it's because I don't like the pope, and I, I wanted to get a, an annulment so I could get married and, uh, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, and so really, the, the Reformation really still hasn't come to England. <laughs> it's just kind of switched. Um, <clears throat> in, in some ways, it's almost like you exchange one pope for another. But we all kind of do that in our own ways. So here's, um, so King James in 1609 comes along, and this is going to tie in the Sabbath very shortly. Um, King James, uh, so as you're thinking, who's the supreme head of the church? In England? Well, in Roman Catholicism, it's the Pope. In England, it's the king. He's the supreme head. So here's what King James says in uh, 1609. So this is where we get our King James Bible from. I conclude then this point touching the power of kings with this axiom of divinity, that is to dispute what God may do is blasphemy. So is it sedition in subjects to dispute what a king may do in the height of his power. So who's the ruler of the church? We say King Jesus is the ruler of the church. But if you're living in 1611 or 1609, it's the king. He's the, the head. He's the supreme head of the church on earth. So what you have in England is you still need reformation, right? Th this kind of thing shows you that we have a long way to go. And you do. You have ministers who are attempting to reform the Anglican church. Um, and remember, there was no separation of church and state, like there's a separation of church and state today. And these ministers are reforming were known as Puritans. I, it's probably a derogatory term, if I remember, um, but they were trying to purify the church. And <clears throat> so you have some ministers in the Anglican church teaching that Jesus is the head and the governor of the church. That's why when you hear RP uh, elders pray at session meetings, Presbyterian Synod, they conclude their prayers as they convene or they uh, close the court. They say, in the name of Jesus Christ, king and head of the church, or Zion's only king and head. Goes all the way back to King Henry VIII and, and King James. So we're saying the head of the church is Jesus, it's not the Pope, and it is not the king. And so as the Reformation is continuing on in England, now that instead of working against the Pope, now they're working against the king. And in the church, you had some followers of the king, and you had some Puritans who were saying, no, no, the king is not the head of the church. And what happened in England, well, have I lost anyone at this point? So what happens in um, England, the pulpit and churches, Sundays became a place and a time where Puritans were trying to reform worship. They were trying to wor reform the church. They were trying to reform the, the doctrine of who is Zion's only king and head, is, is Jesus. So um, I, th I don't remember, you know, we have like a 40-hour, you know, work week now, now a years, right? But I think in, in England in the 1600s, they were, people were probably working 12 hours a day, six days a week. They didn't get vacations. Uh, they, they were working all the time. And so um, Sundays for the Puritans, and for some people who were uh, of like mind of the Puritans in need for reform, um, Sundays were the main day for propagating this teaching and this doctrine. King James did not like this at all, so he tried to shut it down. So what King James does in 1618, he issues what's known as the Declaration of Sports, sometimes known as the Book of Sports. 
and it's a proclamation that outlined lawful sports and recreations permitted on Sundays because King James does not want any more teaching. So you start your service, I don't know what time, at 10 o'clock in the morning, you're done at 11, and everyone leaves, and it's time for recreation. And in 1618, King James made every minister read from the pulpit on the Lord's Day his book of sports. And so here is a section from it. Dancing, either men or women, archery for men, leaping, vaulting, or any su other such harmless recreation, <clears throat> nor from having of May games, wits and ales, and Morris dances, and the setting up of maypoles, and other sports therewith used, so as the same be had in due and convenient time, without impediment or neglect of divine service, and that women shall have leave to carry rushes to the church for the decoring of it, according to their old custom." All right, so basically, the king who is in his own mind, in the minds of many people and many um, Anglican ministers, he is the, the supreme head of the church. The supreme head of the church has published the book and the Declaration of Sports, and he has declared that every minister on the Lord's Day read this from the pulpit. Now, you can imagine that the Puritans did not do this, right? I, because this goes against every principle of the Reformation. Like, even in your own conscience, you know, I, you, you, some men couldn't do this. And so what happened if you didn't do this is that you could be suspended, right? So you have the temporary removal from your clerical duties. You could be deposed. That would be the permanent removal of your position as a minister. You could be imprisoned. So some ministers were imprisoned. Kind of depended, I think, wh what region of England you were in and who your bishop was. But, or you could be fined. Um, so, again, to make a long story short, what the king is doing is he's exercising his supreme authority over the church um, in, in doing this. Now, this is not the first time because his son, Charles I, does the same thing. So here's Charles's view on his own authority, right? He's the supreme head of the church in his own mind. Princes, he said, are not bound to give account of their actions but to God alone. So he's not even subject to church courts, apparently, right? And, I mean, and who's putting the, the crown on the king's head in this picture of King Charles? God. There, it's from heaven, right? This is the divine right of kings. So it's, it's not men that put the, the crown on them. Today, in, in our um, understanding the social contract, we the people, right, give the authority. But here, it comes from God alone. I am not bound to give account of my actions to anyone but God. Now, I, wanna, I want you to think for a moment. I know a lot of Christians that think like this today. There, there are so many Christians that I think carry a kingdom in their own breast, I think, as uh, John Calvin put it. So we might not have a pope, but we all, <laughs> there are a lot of people that think that they are a pope and they're not accountable to any church court. Um, and that was uh, the view of the supreme governor of the church. So King Charles republished the Book of Sports in 1633. And of course, he, like his father, ordered it to be read by ministers from their pulpits on the Lord's Day. And again, doing this touches on key reformational matters of conscience, authority, you know, who, who is the, the king and head of the church, uh, touches on the fourth commandment, worship, hearing God's word. Um, that, that's why you'll find such such emphasis in like um, the larger catechism on conscionable hearing because once you hear the word of God you want to put it into practice so that you you're producing 30 60 100 fold and and the word that is sown and preached and taught in the Lord's day you don't want to fall by the side of the road you know and get gobbled up by the birds or uh, to be you know, not very deeply rooted um, but that's that's that was the concern of, of godly um, ministers so and I want to I want to add something. This is very modern, also, um, because these were some of the same issues touched upon more recently in our church. And what issue more recently were these very issues of authority um, being brought down upon the church, saying you cannot worship, you must close your doors. That's that. This is the same. It was the same. It's the same basic thing. So we we face this with COVID, and the churches face this. Can our government shut down churches? And depending on what state, 
you lived in, there were different rules and regulations and in some places it was harder than others. But the, it boils down to that question, does the, does the state have the authority to say the church is not essential? It, does the church have the, the authority to say the church is not essential, but we can leave liquor stores open on Sundays? There, there is so much hypocrisy in our, our government. And I thought we believed in separation of church and state. Um, I don't know if any of you watched Essential Church. It was about uh, the, these kinds of issues in California and Los Angeles with uh, John MacArthur's congregation and uh, some congregations in Canada. And, um, and they mentioned, uh, I think, a few times the Puritans and the, the Covenanters. Well, this is, th this is the same thing. So if you, you haven't seen it, it's, it's interesting. Um, but it, it, it's the same kind of question we face in our own day. And our brothers and sisters in other countries face this, and, and with depending on what government they are under. So can the book of sports be imposed on ministers and congregations by the king? Does the king have that authority to tell a minister, you must read this, because I'm the supreme head? Th those, kinds of, those kinds of issues you do see in other um, countries. Um, I think even in our own. Can prayer books be imposed on congregations by bishops? That was another issue that came a little bit later. Um, do elders or congregations have the authority to worship in a way that is no longer warranted by God's word? That, that's one thing people don't talk about, the Puritans. So the Puritans weren't just arguing that the king ta can't command me to read the, from the book of sports. I don't have the authority to add new days to God's calendar. I don't have the authority to remove psalms from public worship. So it wasn't just the king. It's like you know, elders also have to ask these questions. So can elders or congregations take out of worship, again, something God's word warrants? And the church has to really wrestle with this, I, I think still to this day, um, because they, we seem, the churches seem to think, yeah, we, we have that authority, but bishops don't, or uh, the state doesn't. So these are, these are issues that, yes, they, the, what happened with the Sabbath was, you know, back in the 17th century, but these are still basic fundamental questions um, that we face in, in our own time. All right, so I've said a lot so far. Any comments or questions? Um, all right, when I used to read these things, I was like, oh, what is a maypole? Well, there's a, a maypole right there for you. So um, these were the things that you were commanded as, you know, by the king, the supreme head, um, you, the, you know, do this after worship, you know, right after. <laughs> so people actually come to worship. I think they were already dressed and, and ready to go. Um, so this was like a folk festival. I think it happens in May. I, w I didn't know what rushes were, so women would decorate churches, I guess, um, with these um, plants during certain festivals. And again, this was um, declared uh, this was to be done. There's a, a minister by the name of Richard Baxter. I'm not a fan of his view of justification, so I'm not um, quoting him for that reason. But he was a good representative of the time of uh, King Charles and, um, and King James uh, before him. So um, Baxter was three years old when the Book of Sports was issued uh, on the authority of King James. So he was born in 1615. Uh, King James issued the declaration in 1618, and, and Baxter was there um, as, a, as a boy. And he, he says uh, of this, reflecting on it uh, later as a minister, I cannot forget in them that in my youth in those late times when we lost the labors of some of our conformable godly teachers for not reading publicly the book of sports and dancing on the Lord's days, one of my father's own tenants was the town piper. And the place of the dancing assembly was not a hundred yards from our door. So his, his dad, again, and others, he remembers, nope, we're not going to read it. But within that same church was the town piper, you know, and, and, and doing these things. Um, Baxter says um, in his recollections as from his boyhood, um, we could not on the Lord's Day either read a chapter or pray or sing a psalm or catechize or instruct a servant, but with the noise of the pipe and tabor, which is a kind of a drum, uh, and the shoutings of the street continually in our ears. So we live in a, you know, kind of a rural place. But back then, the, the church was kind of, I think, us uh, very often in the center of the town. And everyone around um, was, was making so much noise that Baxter says, we couldn't even pray. We could not even pray um, on, on the Lord's Day. Um, <clears throat> so the Reformation in England, right, 
going back to King Henry, was incomplete. And it was also leaning f uh, toward Roman Catholicism. Um, in a book by Joel Beakey and Randall Peterson uh, called Meet the Puritans, um, they, they mentioned that uh, many in King Charles's day uh, were concerned that he was steering England back to Roman Catholicism. So that was a big question. Will you go back to Roman Catholicism? In 1625, King Charles married a devout Catholic, Henrietta Maria. And um, he had his advisor and the bishop of London, William Laud, um, introduced many Catholic forms of worship. And he also su supported Arminian theology, and he prohibited the preaching of predestination. And predestination, if you've ever read like Martin Luther and the Bondage of the Will, um, that's one of the non-negotiable cornerstones of Reformed theology. So there, you're, there is kind of this movement going back to Roman Catholicism. Uh, all clergy had to use their, the prayer book, clerical dress they were made to do, wear. They were the laity. Uh, they had to make the laity kneel while receiving communion. So if you come forward to receive communion, uh, I must make you bow before that. Now, if you know anything about transubstantiation, the adoration of, <laughs> you, you, you don't do that. But so, and you're coming out of that, right? And so now you must literally bow before that. And, and you're being told by the supreme uh, king and head of the church and the highest bishop in the land, uh, you must do this. So what happened is many Puritans chose to emigrate either to the Netherlands or to New England. So in 1630, John Winthrop uh, led the first great Puritan exodus to Massachusetts. And so during the next decade, some of the most esteemed preachers in England, including John Cotton, Thomas Hooker, and Thomas Shepard, joined 13,000 emigrants who sailed to New England. Uh, it was so bad that King Charles uh, cut the ears off of the Puritan William Prynne and branded his face with a hot iron with the letters SL for as being a, a seditious uh, libeler as a, a, a Puritan. So this is, this is kind of the, the we're leading up to uh, where we get the Sabbath and the, the confession from, but there's a lot that was going on in Puritan England at this time, any, uh, and uh, Anglican. So any comments or questions about, the, the, there's a lot going on, but you have um, King uh, James, you have uh, King Charles, uh, you have the Book of Sports, the Book of Declaration, and there are just godly ministers who couldn't um, bow to those things. Mm -hmm. And I think very understandably. Any questions or comments about? Heidi? Yeah, just thinking that um, there's nothing new under the sun. Charles, the first wife, was Catholic and steered him just like Solomon's wives. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> just like Solomon's wives. I hadn't, I, even though we were in Solomon, I hadn't made that connection. Um, yes. And that's why you'll read in the confession about the kinds of people you can marry and can't marry, right? So that, that's going to come up also in chapter 24 of the Westminster Confession. Yes. Any other comments or questions? All right. So here's a, a quick timeline uh, that I put together. Um, again, uh, think of 1618, you have King James, Book of Sports, 1633, King Charles, Book of Sports, um, <coughs> and then in 1642, you have the outbreak of the English Civil War. And what's one of the first things that they do? Well, in 1643, Parliament publicly burned the Book of Sports. All right, that's <laughs> that had a huge role and in influence. And in 1643 through 48, Parliament convened a gathering of ministers to restructure the Church of England according to the scriptures and principles of the Protestant Reformation. And this gathering of ministers is known as the Westminster Assembly. So that's why we have the, the Westminster Confession of Faith. I should have given a picture of the church at Westminster. I didn't think to do that, but... Uh, I teach a catechism class, and I show that a lot. But So they meet in a church uh, in London, and, and this is, um, it was in a place called the Jerusalem Chamber, and that's where they hammered out for, from 1643 to 48, uh, the larger catechism, shorter, 
uh, directory for public worship, confession of faith. So this is, uh, this is in some ways, you know, they, the, the church had been thinking about this since 1517, and in a particular national way, really since Henry VIII had, um, had left and become the supreme, you know, governor and head uh, of the church. Um, so that, that's, that's where we're, we're coming from. Mm. So theologically, you're, you're hitting, in some ways, it's almost like the apex of the Reformation. So the, the, over 100, you know, we could say like 150 years of, of thinking uh, have gone into this. So they were some of the greatest minds and theologians um, in history. All right, so as we just, uh, I could focus on worship. There, there's so many things that kind of flow from this, but we're in Isaiah 58. And you can see the influence of Isaiah 58 as it refers to the, the Lord's Day. And again, we can apply this to Holy Week too. So you're not at, like, w so when we worship, we try to worship according to what God has commanded. So there must be a command, there must be an example. If there's not, we don't, we don't do it. Um, and that's related to why we don't have holy days. You know, this is why we don't celebrate Holy Week. Uh, we, we, all of these things are come to a head on the Lord's Day, right? The 52 Lord's Days of the year. That's, that's the day that God has set aside. But we don't, have, we don't have the authority to say, nope, there's 50 days and not 52. Um, nor do we have the right to say we're going to start adding more and more holy days uh, to, to the calendar. Um, so, so as you read the confession, now you have that history uh, in your, your mind of what's going on, and you can see as the parliament says, okay, we're looking for the best um, divines, they were called, a divine is a minister. And in chapter 21, this Sabbath is then kept holy unto the Lord when men after a due preparing of their hearts and ordering of their common affairs beforehand do not only observe and holy rest all the day from their own works, words, and thoughts about their worldly employments and recreations. There's Isaiah 58, um, and of course other texts too, but also are taken up the whole time in the public and private exercises of his worship and in the duties of necessity and mercy. So it's a day of work. Mercy, necessity, and piety. John, did you have a question? Yeah, it says right there about um, in the public and private exercises of his worship. So there's uh, Reformed Christians who who agree that we shouldn't like celebrate Easter and Christmas in public worship, but they believe that they have the liberty to to uh, practice it privately. Uh, what would you say? about that and also what if they wanted to celebrate Holy Week privately as well? What are your thoughts on that? So I, th I think, and th I think this is one of the geniuses of, of Puritanism, um, that there is discretion and wisdom given to sessions um, about certain matters. So if a, a session uh, pastor says, you know, we're, we are going to preach on the resurrection this coming Lord's Day. They, they have that freedom and discretion. Uh, there, there is no supreme governor uh, who's going to say you can't do that from any pulpit in the land. Um, and I don't know, even of people who celebrate Christmas, for example, um, it, I don't think they're celebrating like the, the Mass. So, that, so part of the, the, the Catholic celebration of Christmas was the adoration of the the consecrated bread and wine, which they believe is the body and blood. So, yes, if people are doing that in their home, they, you wouldn't be a minister for very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and the WCF, it mentions that we shouldn't uh, marry papists, but I think by practicing those privately, like, Christmas and Easter, it's like we're marrying the papist calendar to God's calendar of 52 holy days. Yeah, and, and, there's, and I respect that view of people who don't celebrate Christmas, um, but I, uh, um, I, that's not like the position of um, the RPCNA or other. Um, yeah, so you're, you're welcome. You, people are welcome to have that. But that's not something that every family, so that's something that's left to the discussion of households. Yeah, and that, that's where it's left in our denomination. And, but again, if households are celebrating it and 
um, some kind of consecrated bread and they're worshiping before um, the tabernacle of, you know, where the, the bread is kept or something. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that would, so that's the problem you have in the 1600s, right? You're coming out of Roman Catholicism. Today, it, the, we, Catholicism is really a non-issue. It's secularism, and these things have no meaning. You know, you can be, a, you can be of another religion and celebrate Christmas um, because it, has, it doesn't have the ties anymore to uh, the, the Mass, or, and for many people, it has no ties to Jesus. So you have atheists celebrating Christmas, Jewish people celebrating Christmas, um, Muslims, yeah. Mm, yeah. So it, it doesn't have that meaning anymore. It's, I think the meaning has changed. I think it was uh, maybe uh, two years ago, I remember going to the nursing home and uh, one of the ladies asked me if I celebrate Christmas and I said, no. And she asked if I was Jewish. So they, they do realize, people know that it is a religious holy day and not a uh, secular one. Yeah, but again, I think in the minds of most people, when they say, do you celebrate Christmas, they don't mean, uh, do you go to Mass and do you adore the elements? For them, it, it means, do you, do you remember the Incarnation? So the meaning has changed. So that, that's, a, that's a, so the, the meaning, you have to understand over hundreds of years that the meaning has changed. So a lot of people, when they, they ask that kind of question, they mean, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in the incarnation? They're not asking, did you go to mass? Or they're not asking, do you go on Ash Wednesday and get, you know, ashes on your head or something like that? It's, um, so for, for Christmas uh, and what it means for us today, it's very different than what it meant 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. It wasn't secularized 400 years ago. So remember I began tonight saying <clears throat> you have, a, we'll say, 150 years. You, you, they've been thinking about this coming out of the context of Rome. For the last 150 years in our own nation, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I know there are Catholics, but w we live in a secular society, and it's actually Bible-believing Christians who have dismantled the Sabbath. Um, but we don't, we don't live in Puritan England anymore. So when people talk about Christmas, it's not the Mass anymore. So these things have changed, yeah. And I, so I, th I do think that that's important to understand as, as we're looking at the, the larger catechism here, how it's to be sanctified, bringing it back to the issue of delight and heart. And again, I can't emphasize enough that we are on the, the bottom of 150 years. So when, when people ask, do you celebrate Christmas, you have to be thinking, okay, this is not a person who's asking me in 1600. This is a person who has, pro uh, this is one of the problems in our society, very little, probably th for, they don't have, a, um, they certainly don't have a knowledge of uh, the Protestant movement or anything like that, what we talked about. Um, th this is a person who has uh, been taught probably not to believe in the fourth commandment, but this is a person who thinks that, that Christmas equals the incarnation. So as you, a, you answer with wisdom and patience and gentleness, you say, of course I celebrate the incarnation. The incarnation is a part of my life. I died and rose with Christ when I was born again. And um, have you been born again? Because a lot of times people are asking that question. They go to church, but they don't know about you must be born again. Well, I was baptized, and therefore my original, you know, that... So it offer, there's a very different discussion that happens in the 21st century than the, the 17th century. And so if we're giving 17th century answers to 21st century questions, we're going to be talking past one another, and we're going to miss a gospel opportunity. Yeah. So it's important to understand like the, the time in which, which we live. It's important to understand how we got to where we're at, but it's, under, it's important to understand we are at the bottom of this abyss, this void, um, because of bad Christian theology. Yeah. Heidi? This goes back a little bit, but I'm a little slow. You said it's mostly the church that has gotten rid of the Sabbath because of dispensationalism. Uh -huh, so yeah. is that because the idea is that the Sabbath ended with Christ? and that that was one of the laws of the Old Testament, and so we no longer keep that? Or it, and it's like we only, we only keep the nine commandments now? 
Uh, I'm so to go back to my initial one of my earlier slides on you know there's so many things that you could look at um, on the Sabbath, but a lot of people will pick up on statements that Paul makes, right? Um, that that uh, that seem to do away with the the Sabbaths, right? Um, they will say that in the Mosaic Covenant we don't observe um, the, these feast days anymore, so the whole Mosaic Covenant is done. They don't understand that it's a creation ordinance. I, I, there, so there's a lot of problems. So let me let me just give you. I'm gonna I'm gonna. I, people are gonna really not like me for this, but I'll just I'll 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 put it this way. John MacArthur is a dispensationalist. He is no friend of the fourth commandment. <clears throat> And, and here's something to think about. John MacArthur does not and has never preached the whole counsel of God. And he made that decision when he decided not to preach through the Old Testament. He's a dispensationalist, and there's a theological reason he doesn't preach. Now, he might preach on Isaiah 53 or a key passage. He won't preach through Isaiah or books of the Bible. You won't find a commentary on that. And, and, and he's not preaching the whole counsel of God. And that, that's a big difference between the Reformed Protestant movement and later 19th century dispensationalism. And so he comes along, and, and the people say, well, I follow MacArthur, and it's like, yeah, but here's a man. He, he, I mean, he, do, he would get in a lot of trouble if you started hearing him preach the Old Testament. And when he does, he does get into trouble because of his particular millennial views and how he comes down on that. But... When the New Testament, when Paul talks about preaching the whole counsel of God in the book of Acts, he's talking about the Old Testament. When you read the New Testament, there's so much Old Testament in it. You're like, these churches had to know the Old Testament inside and out. But he doesn't do that. I don't think you'll find, maybe there is now. I don't know if there is a commentary he's done on, on an Old Testament book. Maybe Proverbs or something. But the whole counsel of God includes Genesis through Malachi. So yes, it, that has huge ramifications, implications for worship, uh, Lord's Day, and, and we're reaping the, the fruit of that now because if you have a conviction that I should be worshiping on the Lord's Day, it's totally lost on our culture, and you can't even find the time to do that. You, you could tell a company, right? This is one of the things we tell our kids. If you're looking for a job, tell them you can't keep work on the Lord's Day. Tell them you work the other six days of the week. Tell them you work on whatever holidays they want. But, and what do they say? No. They, now you can't even work six days of the week because you want to honor the Lord. And, and now people who want to honor the Lord, they, now they're working, and now Christians are making them work on the Lord's Day. When the fourth commandment says you should give your servants rest, right? So, and the first four commandments, right, we remember, we say that's the first table of the law. The first four commandments are our duty towards God. But guess what? The fourth commandment is a duty towards God and our neighbor, right, our servant, our employee, so they can worship the Lord, but how many of us have ha known people or siblings or cousins that are, they, they're told by their employer, you must work on the Lord's Day. And they don't have the support to say no because you could say, well, my, like, no Christians believe that anymore. If you're a Jew, they would say, oh, I don't know you get Saturdays off. You know, if you're a Muslim, oh, maybe Fridays. A Muslim's view is different on, on their day of rest. But for a Christian, Sunday, that's not even on the books. S somehow we have discipled our culture in the last 150 years to, to completely eradicate any sense of rest on the Lord's Day. It's gone. And, and, and remember, the Pur many Puritans came here in the first place so that they could have that freedom. So we've lost that, and we've lost that. That's part of the salt and the light that we lost. And now a person who in good conscience wants to keep the Lord's Day, um, you're going to have to make a lot of sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And, and it, nobody knows. It's a good witness. So it's a, it's a wonderful Christian witness. But it, it's, uh, I, I think the church has itself to blame for. It's, I'm not going to blame secularism because that we've, we've, we left a huge hole and void with dispensationalism. And guess what? Secularism said, we'll fill it with something else. And they did. They did. And I, I really believe the church is partly to blame for that. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, those are really good questions and difficult. So again, as you're dealing with ordinary Christians, they, they've never heard this. To them, it seems normal that you never preach on the Old Testament. The best preachers of our day don't do that. Um, and there's a 150 years. It's like the opposite of what's happening in w w Westminster, right? You have all this thinking of re Reformation, great Westminster theologians today. 
It's the opposite of that. You always have to keep that in mind. So I, I, I'm, I, can't explain, I can't explain enough how much this has helped me think about the Lord's Day and delight in it and why we do what we do on it. Um, but I don't give 17th century answers right away to people who are asking 21st century questions like, oh, there's 10 commandments? <laughs> like, wait, God, when he converts you, he writes the law in your heart? Yeah. <laughs> Which law is that? Well, the, the Ten Commandments. And worshiping God. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not forsaking the assembly. So now you argue with Christians, do you even have to go to public worship? And they will vehemently say, no, no, you know. And it's like, so we, we you have to think, where are we living at, you know, in this timeline of history? And um, the, the, the confession is so helpful. It, it roots you in that. But the kinds of answers that we're giving are just so really basic. Really basic answers. Mm. John? Now, what about Christians that are in a solid church and, and they're hearing uh, sermons and Bible studies preached about uh, keeping the fourth commandment, but yet they still don't want to. They still believe that, like the Christian Sabbath, that the Lord's Day and the Sabbath are two different things, and they just want to, you know, play sports or watch sports. Um, should those Christians be able to be allowed to partake in the Lord's Supper? Um, yeah, it, it depends on a, a case-by-case um, basis. Um, right Tonight we're only dealing with one of the Ten Commandments, and we could go through the catechisms at all ten of the commandments and see how the church has dropped the ball, right? So if churches are, uh, I'm just, I'll just, I mean, you could pick on, um, so you could pick on the fourth commandment, you could pick on the fifth commandment, sixth, seventh, um, I, <laughs> I uh, yeah, marriage, divorce, it, it, it's all over the place. Yeah, we, there's a real, so it's, it, dispensationalism has done away with the law in that, right? It's, it's kind of an antinomianism. So we, there's so much work to be done, and, and people grow up, and you have your favorite preachers that you listen to on the radio, and they'll say the Sabbath in itself is nothing. You know, great men, right? Better men than I am, but theologically, that's like, that's, that's terrible. And, and uh, so, yeah, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> we have 150 years <laughs> to go. We've lost that, and we have a heritage, so we, we, don't, we don't lose it because we have that. But um, we have a lot of work to do. And, and, and um, all around. So it's, it's praying for, and, and I think at the end of the day, right, you're praying for revival because only the Spirit can give you a delight in the pleasures of God, whether it, it's, it's his day, whether it's uh, marriage, uh, whether it's understanding, you know, if you're male or female. I mean, there's so many things that, um, um, yeah, that, that we, that our work is definitely cut out. We need to live as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And I'm just going to, I have to close here, but I want to say, you know, for, you, you want to start teaching your children at a young age, right? So you're going to, you're teaching them all, all of the catechism. So I'm, again, I'm just focusing on the fourth commandment because we're in Isaiah. Um, but you want to teach your kids, you know, a book like this, um, the best day of the week. What's the best day of the week? It's the Lord's Day, right? Happy Lord's Day in every family. So you want to make, you, it's going to take wisdom as parents, you want to make this day a, a delight for your children. Right? But you can't, right? There's one sense you can't because only God can do that in the heart. But um, that, that's, that, that's the mentality. Um, Daniel Howe, and I'll, I'll close with this. Um, I'm a little bit over and I apologize. But in his book, uh, Worship, Feasting, Rest, and Mercy, he says to parents with minor children, but this really applies to all of us in some ways. He says, um, it, I think it's it. It is your job to make sure your kids rest. And like many important ways you care for them, they won't necessarily appreciate it. You, have, you may have dreams of hockey scholarships or an NFL career for them. Those dreams may be good, or they may crush your beloved children. Start dreaming God's dreams for them instead, that they would flourish in God's courts when they are old. Psalm 92, which he points out this is a psalm for the Sabbath, <laughs> if you look at the, uh, the title for it. Um, pray that they and you would see their children's children and pray for the peace of Israel. 
that they would make you and God glad by their wisdom and kindness. Pray that they would rebuild ruins, there's Isaiah 58, and restore streets. In other words, that they would be people whose works last for generations. And that they would delight themselves in the Lord, Isaiah 58, 13, and 14. So you, you have to start teaching these things um, uh, to your children. And, and the, the part of the problem is we have, you know, great-grandparents today or, you know, older for 150 years that have never heard of, of any of this. You know, like, it, they've never even heard this. That, like, what I'm saying is like, whoa, I, I, where'd this come from? And, uh, whoa, yeah, you have a, I'm so excited for you. <laughs> there's, there's so much to learn. Um, but, yeah, it, it starts early on. All right, so... Um, so again, if, uh, I appreciate the questions. We can talk um, later about it um, and uh, pray that the Lord, um, we, we really are in need of revival today. So pray for the, the work of the Holy Spirit and that these uh, truths would be delightfully uh, announced. Um, there, there's nothing greater in that. And like I said, it's a constant struggle in my own heart to delight in these things. All right, any items for prayer, praise, or thanksgiving?